Hello, everyone. Welcome back. My name is Jenna. My name is Hannah. And today we have another great music therapist as well as another podcaster with us today. If you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks so much. Great to be here. Um, my name is Joe Thompson, and I'm a neurologic music therapist and a podcaster, like you said. Before I want to introduce myself too much, I just want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that I'm on, the Darug people of the Aboriginal people here in Australia around Western Sydney, acknowledge their elders past and present. Yeah, I'm a, a neurologic music therapist, like I said. Um, I've just, just started my newest venture, which I've called Phoenix Neurologic Music Therapy, which is um, my own uh, sole trader business servicing Western Sydney and um, in here in Australia. As part of that, I'm working with some private clients and also working at a little clinic called ANJ Therapy and Learning, which is a multidisciplinary clinic where I'm a contractor. Yeah, so great to be here. Jill, can you tell us a little bit about how did you find out about music therapy? What really drew you to this profession? What made you say, this is what I want to do? Where I first encountered music therapy as an idea, as a profession, was actually pretty mundane. It was just in a careers handbook once. So the story was that I'd always grown up being interested in music, um, but also pretty clear that I didn't want to be a music teacher. Unfortunately, the role of lead singer for Radiohead was taken, so I didn't see myself being a performance musician. And so I um, had left the idea of a career in music behind, and so I was trying to think what, it, what I could do uh, as a career. I was very involved with an organization at that time called World Vision, which um, I hear is not quite as well known in the States, but it's an international aid and development organization. And so I was looking to really find something where I could, you know, try and um, support people who had uh, didn't have the same privilege as I had growing up in Australia, but also found that those sort of organizations didn't need the skills that I sort of had. And so one day I was sitting at a bus stop with a person who was a bit older than me, but had gone to school with me. And she was telling me about how she was studying to be a nurse. And um, I thought, okay, well, this sounds good. And I went home and told my mom, I'm going to be a nurse. And um, she didn't react to my mom, but I'm sure in her mind, she was thinking, well, that's great intention, but you've never taken any biology classes and you were pretty bad at science and you were scared <laughs> of skeletons and stuff when you were a kid. So let's look through the careers handbook and see if there's maybe a bit more of a middle ground. And as we we're flicking through this thing that just happened to be at home, we found this thing called music therapy and it was a pretty easy decision. Yeah, just from about um, being about 17, I decided that that's what I'd do and I plotted a course from there. But I also tell as part of my story that even though that was the initial encounter with the idea, that, that idea was really solidified for me as I, um, as I grew up for a lot of my teenage life, um, living with a person with dementia. So my, my father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's when I was about um, 14 or 15. Uh, he had had a minor traumatic brain injury and developed short-term memory problems, which then escalated into diagnosable Alzheimer's. He had to leave his job, and um, obviously it was difficult for him to uh, even do some basic kind of parenting things. But um, in the evening, sometimes he'd get agitated, so we'd put on some music, some of his favorite James Taylor, and I would get my guitar and just noodle along to the chords and give myself some oral training at the same time. And he would really um, become much more settled as a result of that. And even though sometimes as he progressed, he'd forget the names of um, his friends, he would generally recall the words to the songs. And so I realized that music definitely does have a pretty unique and powerful impact. And I wanted to be able to capture that and use that in my career, which is yeah, what I've striven to do since then. Awesome. When you were kind of going through your college experience, what did you really like about the education that you received in music therapy? And what was something that if you could go back, you would change or want to see grow? There's two universities in Australia, um, we call them universities, colleges, um, that offer music therapy. I 
went to one called Western Sydney University. And it's a university that at the time that I went to was going through a little bit of a change. Um, there was previously a small but very committed group of Nordoff Robbins music therapists or creative music therapists. And they had been running the course and in, the, in many sense running the industry in Sydney. And for whatever reason, that was sort of coming to an end. And at the same time, there was this sort of new wave of what I maybe just call very broadly like developmental music therapists starting to emerge. At the same time, the broader context was here in Australia, something had just been legislated called the National Disability Insurance Scheme, which is um, probably similar to your Department of Developmental Disability. So it's this insurance scheme that was suddenly available to um, not organisations, but to participants. So they could have um, funding allocated so that they could then choose what supports they wanted. And this was a fantastic opportunity for music therapists. Um, suddenly there was a whole lot more work available, but at the same time, there was all these new compliance requirements, um, reporting requirements, and music therapists were having to develop goals and develop um, progress reporting templates and measurement systems to be able to give evidence to the efficacy of their work. And so this was, of course, happening just at the time when I began my um, tertiary training. And um, the course was clearly like wrestling with what does this mean for us? What does this mean for us as a whole community? What does this mean for us as a profession? What does this mean for this training institution? And so it was a, a state of flow, a state of flex. And um, what I think I really enjoyed about that was being in close proximity with a number of supervisors and lecturers who, as a result of this change, had very different viewpoints. And I could really delve deeply into some of the more Nordoff Robbins music therapy approaches and then some of these uh, more eclectic approaches and find out what made them tick. I suppose what was challenging was the same, though, that there was this instability. It was sort of like, where do I sit in, the, in these different camps? But thankfully, these conversations have since evolved and, and the course is more settled. So it's, it was an interesting experience for sure. I would love to hear you speak a little bit about different theoretic orientations and how that has changed for you over your course of learning about music therapy to becoming your own practitioner. And how does that inform your work today? What really resonates with you? Yeah, I'd love to speak to that. To go right back to the beginning of my story, like I was alluding to before, what I noticed in the most anecdotal and personal and unscientific way with my father was that music was the thing having an effect. I often wasn't even looking at him when I was noodling around or to be honest, I could have put on the CD player and then walked away. And so I always was really committed to the idea of having music as the agent of change. And then I would describe because I went and did a bachelor's of music and people obviously ask, why are you doing a bachelor's of music? And there's not a whole lot of job prospects. So I would say, oh, there's this thing called music therapy. And people would, of course, go, what on earth is that? And I would describe <laughs> music therapy without really realizing it in a fairly, you could almost say narrow um, terms, that music was the therapeutic agent of change, working on functional developmental skills. And then I came to the course the music therapy course and found that there were music therapists, like we're alluding to, that didn't necessarily actually practice according to those particular ideals. There was this creative music therapy framework that did very much use music as the agent of change, using a music-based approach, music-centered approach. And so that really resonated with me. But the importance of relationship was something that was there as well which I hadn't really come across before. Um, the idea that relationship um, using a very humanistic framework was potentially as central to the music in the potential to affect a person's ability to develop and grow. That was always a tension for me. And then as um, I came across other ideas, um, people started to talk about functional developmental skills, um, using music therapy to um, develop things like fine motor, gross motor, 
um, attention, cognitive skills, all these things, communication, for whatever reason, I don't think this is normative, but um, the the role of relationship seemed to become more important than the role of music. People weren't actually sure from what I could observe, maybe this was my own poor observation skills, how music could affect some of the goals that they were working towards. Of course, now I know that that, um, that music is does have these power, um, these properties. But um, seeing this tension and seeing the way that um, relationship and music were almost at this kind of loggerheads, which I think is um, is they don't need to be, um, was was quite confusing and um, quite challenging. And I was always trying to hold on to the value of music to affect change, the properties, the intrinsic properties of music as the thing to lead my work with. And but but still figuring out what exactly those properties of music were when that wasn't always spelled out explicitly for us. How do you feel like that has sort of changed for you over the years? Is it something where it's continuously adapting for you? I know obviously you introduce yourself as a neurologic music therapist, which some would say it's completely different than where you had started in your education. Yes. Yeah, so thank you for prompting me there. So what um, ended up happening, the, the later part of my story is I came into the workforce um, having had the experience that I just described and tried to pursue uh, a version of music therapy that satisfied the reporting requirements and measurement requirements of the government um, regulation at the time. And so was spending a lot of time writing um, goal banks and um, intervention banks and all these sort of things to give a framework. And for maybe one to four years in my first workplace, which was a, a music therapy workplace exclusively, um, me and my colleagues were trying to answer this question and, and see what that would look like. And as much as we made progress and we really did the best that we could and, and I was very proud of what we made at the time, um, I got to the point in 2021 where I was just feeling like what I was doing was not really making that much of a difference and I wasn't seeing a whole lot of progress in people's life. It probably didn't help that that was also the time of the pandemic and here in Sydney we went into a lockdown and so all of the clients that I saw were by telehealth and it's always more constricting to see people over zoom um but i was feeling this dissatisfaction and at just recently i had completed the neurologic music therapy training and found that um my past preconception of nmt was that it was this framework more mostly for traumatic brain injury clients or stroke clients or Parkinson's clients and it was quite a narrow approach I found that that was not the case and actually uh, the NMT had these underlying principles and um, ideals that were actually quite consistent with the ones that I um, outlined earlier the ones that were so important to me right from the beginning of my first experiences with music therapeutic music and so I was quite excited by this and the other part of that training was I was exposed to the work of Suzanne Oliver, who is at the Neurologic Music Therapy Services of Arizona. And she showed her work of applying the principles of neurologic music therapy with autistic and developmental disability populations, particularly in children. And that had been the work that I had been doing um, in my clinic here in Sydney. And it was so noticeably effective within the space of a two or three minute video clip, you could see how the music was changing a person's body in real time. And so I thought, this is what's been missing from my practice. And so I reached out to her um, and we started doing some mentoring sessions over Zoom for one hour or a fortnight or one hour a month. And while that was like fantastic, I would ask one question and she would answer and that would make me want to ask 20 follow-up questions. And so I thought, I just need more of this in my life and I'm not going to get that on Zoom. She was advertising position at her clinic at the time. And so I um, asked her, would it be worth me applying so I could come and have a visit? And she was very generous and said, yeah, by all means apply. 
So I did, I put in an application and I was successful in that application. To this day, I think that says a lot more about her generosity than my skill. But anyway, a few months later, um, I ended up in Phoenix in Arizona and was really immersing myself in NMT and the frameworks and the work and how it could be applied so powerfully. So to come back to your question, yeah, um, I feel like I've finally come to the point where I've found what I had been looking for for so long. Um, I'd always been interested in this idea of NMT, but I hadn't realized that um, what I had been describing without knowing the name of it really actually was NMT. And so I was so, so happy (laughs) that there were other practitioners like me who had done the work that I had wished had been done. And once I stumbled across that, Um, there was a framework that really aligned with me that I could incorporate into my own practice. Can you share a little bit about your internship experience? What is that like in Australia? I don't really know very much about that. I know what ours is like here in the States. I don't know what the similarities Mm. and differences are. So where did you go? What was that experience like? Where did you really grow in yourself during that process? Yeah, absolutely. So it's it's definitely a bit of a different process. We don't need to apply for internships. We just get given them. So it's a little bit easier for us. And rather it being a, a block internship, like I think you do, we go on, we call it placement, and it's one day of placement throughout the entire course. So rather than being in a facility Monday to Friday for several months on end, um, we will just turn up every Thursday or whatever it is and observe the music therapist working um, and then go off and do our classes and stuff like that. Um, so I did four placements across my course. Most of them were in a, we call them SSP, School for Specific Purposes, so um, schools for kids with various disabilities. One of the most formative ones, though, for me was when I um, started accompanying a music therapist um, near where I was living on the south coast of New South Wales and um, she was working with adults who had various disabilities Um, and for the first time I was doing with her one-on-one work. Seems kind of basic but just having individual sessions and slightly differently to some of the other experience I had on placement she really encouraged me to use the full breadth of my musicality. And um, that was fantastic for me because I felt like I had a lot to offer in that sense. And even though it's kind of quite different to the way that I practice now, knowing that all of my um, theory and piano harmonic skills and knowledge were actually useful because they were the things that I always felt most confident in was really affirming. And so I gained a lot of confidence from that time, which is really what I needed. I feel like for me, at least being a student was, um, especially given what I was telling you a little bit before, being a bit unsure of where I sat amongst the music therapy community, sometimes feeling a bit like a fish out of water, just having the confidence to know that my skills were useful and would be usable in my career was really important. And to get that confidence was um something I'm continually grateful for now as a clinician. Can you speak a little bit on your certification experience, Um, particularly because I understand it's a bit different in Australia than it is in the States, how that process was like for you in Australia? And then also, since you did spend a bit of time in the States, how that transferred over when you were here? Yeah, yeah. So um, a fun little experience, I guess. So most of us here, once we finish our master's in music therapy, Once we've completed the coursework and submitted all our essays and research proposals and passed them, then we have passed the course and we have the qualifications necessary for um, practice. And then we just go and register with the Australian Music Therapy Association. And uh, once we've paid our money, then we're registered. So there's no big exam or anything like that. And then we just, as long as we continue keeping up our professional development points, and keep on paying our registration fees, then we're all good to go. But then, yeah, um, it got to that point where I wanted to come to Arizona in 
the states to work and so i needed to become board certified on top of being an rmt a registered music therapist which is the acronym we use here in australia so i actually had to fly to adelaide which is a city in a state called south australia um about a three hour plane trip because that was the only place in the whole country that offered a cbmt exam and Mm. It was kind of funny because I had been, I'd been a music therapist for like four years already. So um, I, I wasn't really in the headspace for studying and I was doing a lot of like passport and visa and housing and accommodation organization. So I didn't really feel like studying and so I didn't do any study for the exam. And I just hoped that being a music therapist for four years would be enough to go on. And then I arrived at this dingy little dark room examiner facility center in um, the suburbs of Adelaide and there was people there who were who turned up to do like phishing accreditation exams or how to use Microsoft Word exams all these just very random things and we all got put into different little sections of the room um, and I did my exam thankfully um, just for me a bit of music therapy common knowledge was enough to go on and I passed the exam. Uh, it would have been a total disaster if I'd failed. Um, I would have basically had to reschedule my whole trip. So I probably was a little bit flippant about that, but managed to scrape through. Um, so it wasn't too much of a stressful experience other than having to change states to sit the exam, and book flights and stuff. I'm curious what your thoughts were. Was there, as, as someone who perhaps didn't you know, I'm not sure if the if the the education is is entirely different here in the states than it is there. But as you're kind of going through the test, was it sort of a shock? Were there questions that you were like, I don't even know what this is, or was it pretty standardized that you were like, yeah, this is what I would expect in a standardized test for music therapy? Yeah, to be honest, I think it just felt pretty normal. It felt like music therapy common knowledge is the best way I can put it. The sort of stuff that you would come across, either you'd come across in your work and it, it was just part of the, the bread and butter of what you would do, or if you didn't come across it, you could at least follow some pretty standard therapeutic reasoning to find the answer. Um, as I was answering the questions, it's not like I was thinking of a particular answer in a particular textbook or a particular journal by some particular publication. It was just like I was on the job thinking through the, what I would do naturally and then I just answered based on what I would do in that situation and thankfully they turned out to be the right answers. Yeah. Switching gears a little bit here, for continuing education, continuing your development as a therapist, what do you find is really helpful for you? What are you seeking out? What are your interests? And how does that work in Australia? I'm sure this is more or less the case for a lot of people, but music therapy is such a big thing. And music therapists can work in so many different fields that when you you come out of university with your qualification, there's still so much room to kind of sink yourself into the specialization of the particular population you're working with. And each different population has such particular needs. Um, So I think ongoing education is really important. For me, more than anything, I suppose supervision has been the thing that I've reached for first and foremost. So it's a little bit inconsistent, but I still tried to more or less do like once a month or once every two month supervision meetings with Suzanne Oliver, um, who I talked about earlier. I think having someone who you can ask really difficult questions to is just vital um, and someone who you trust that their answers are going to be as close to good judgment as possible. And then within the neurologic music therapy community, there's some really other there's some other really good resources. There's local support chapters, which they're local, but they're on Zoom. So I'm still part of the Arizona support chapter, as well as being part of the Australia support chapter. And both of those are fantastic. And then there's the global support meetings, um, which come out once a month that I catch up on in my time zone, because they're at like 4am in the morning on a Saturday morning, otherwise. 
Um, but these things, you know, like one of the things about neurologic music therapy is I know that there's a lot of people with that accreditation, but quite a small percentage of those people seem to access regularly all of these training opportunities, which I think is a huge loss to them because that's the best part of being an NMT. It's not the acronym on your name. It's being able to um, delve into all of these fantastic resources. But on top of that, I think it's also really important to look for training and education outside of the music therapy world, broadly speaking. So I haven't actually gotten around to doing this, but um, two things for me that have come across my radar that I'm really keen to do is doing something called a rhythmic movement training course, which is all about integrating retained privative reflexes, which um, are really common amongst um, pediatric neurodisability populations and doing some sensory integration training as well. So that's something that, you know, occupational therapists and speech therapists and physiotherapists all strive to do, or, or the good ones do at least, I might be tongue in cheek in saying. Um, so doing those kind of courses, I think is really important so that we're not just at the best of our own industry, but actually meeting the industry standard across allied health more generally. So I will acknowledge, you asked me about what it looks like in Australia. Most of those things I just referenced are actually based internationally. Um, which for me, that has worked really well. I think, thankfully, that's the world that we live in at the moment, that we are, uh, after the pandemic, especially we're so connected over Zoom and so we can access all these fantastic international resources. Um, before the pandemic in Australia, it did feel a little bit smaller and finding um, people who had practiced for a really long time was a little bit more difficult to do. And then they might form a bit of a different approach or something like that. And so, yeah, very thankful that even though I am here in the Antipodes, I can still connect with people like Suzanne and Vienna, who you've interviewed, and, and all my friends in Canada and UK and America. Focusing a little bit more on supervision, what do you feel like works really well for you in terms of receiving supervision and also potentially supervising students in interns in the future. What does that look like for you in terms of things that you feel like are really beneficial in supervision? I think it's an important question. Personally, I think that a sort of knowledge-based or knowledge transfer version of supervision is what is particularly necessary and useful for me. So what I mean by that is just, I know that there's some forms of supervision where You'd explore your own emotional reactions to your work, explore what might be holding you back or helping you to move forward um, sort of psychologically. I think that that has a place, but um, within my work at least, um, there's not too many like big complex emotions of clients that I'm working with. So um, my emotional response is not going to impact the work to the same extent the thing that always holds me back more than anything is my own um, lack of should we say clinical self-confidence um, I always felt as a music therapist that I was a bit of an imposter in the world of allied health um, talking to like a, a doctor or an occupational therapist I'd always just assume that they knew so much more than I did and that I was just this weird person who knew a lot about G major and how to draw a travel clip, you know, stuff that wasn't actually going to be that useful. And so for me, being able to learn about um, populations, diagnosis, sensory needs, and then the role of music to affect all of those things, how music is understood neurologically and how we can support clients really well, how, how to help this particular person that I'm seeing. That not only means that I'm more effective in my job, but it means I'm more confident in my own um, clinical reasoning and, and clinical knowledge and I can represent both the whole profession and myself better in an allied health team or multidisciplinary team so that's really important for me. Speaking now about starting work as an individual music therapist where was your first job at what was it like looking for a job what support did you have? Did you go immediately into the job field or did you take a little bit of a break? And yeah. what were some of those things you were looking for in a job that you were like, this is a non-negotiable for me. This is what I really need in a career. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it sounds a bit silly, but I 
was coming through at this time of flux and change, like I, I said, but when I first started the course, it seemed like there were just not that many jobs available at all. And so I actually got halfway to the end of my music therapy masters. And in that summer break, I seriously considered dropping out because I just didn't think that I would actually be able to get a job, that there wasn't enough jobs going around. Um, I was also living in a regional area that time um, on the south coast of New South Wales, south of a little city called Wollongong, if anyone's interested. Um, and of course, down there, there was even less job prospects. And the, really the only reason I stayed in the course was just that I had left it too late to enroll in anything else. So I thought, well, I'm here now. Then when I get, did get to graduation, I was just looking for whatever I could find. And as far as non-negotiables were, I was really just looking for something that was as close to full time as possible. That was really all I, that was, I set myself the lowest bar possible. It was a big source of anxiety for me. And so I ended up um, applying for a job that was right next door to where the university was run. I did that even though it was about a two and a half hour drive from my house. So I was getting up very early. Um, it was about 200 kilometers away from where I was living. So that was, that was a challenge. Um, I ended up moving closer by and wasn't commuting for too long. But yeah, it turned out that I got that job quite comfortably. I was very fortunate in that sense. It was the first job that I applied for and it was um, pretty much everything I wanted. I was very well supported there. And then since then, I've since coming back from America, I've been applying for a few different jobs. And again, um, I've been very thankful and, and fortunate to basically get the first job that I apply for each time. And so it's um, not been nearly as difficult as I expected it to be. Now I'm at the point, I suppose, where I do have particular things that I'm looking for. I'm a lot more picky in terms of a workplace, but um, yeah, at that time it felt very different and I was just grateful to, to get whatever I could. Transitioning a little bit more to your podcast and your advocacy work what sort of inspired you to start interviewing other music therapists and can you speak a little bit about your podcast and what the interviews that you've done what's been your purpose around it yeah thank you for bringing that up you know it's lovely to have some promotion on your podcast it's great when our podcasts can work together we'll have to continue that so I might just name it so if anyone wants to look it up they can the podcast is called baselines in music therapy you can find it on apple podcasts and on spotify and it's similar to this one it's an interview based podcast um i suppose it feeds in a little bit to what we were talking about earlier that um i had often felt throughout my education and the first part of my career that I was, I was a little bit lost. I was a little bit of a fish out of water. It was hard to find my people as a music therapist. It was hard to find a therapeutic framework that aligned with me. And it was also hard to find just the sort of the elders that had gone before me and walked the path that um, I hadn't walked yet. And so I wanted to start creating um, a resource for people like me, but perhaps who were a little bit... Um, earlier in their journey so that they wouldn't have to go quite as alone as I had felt. And so I um, initially just started reaching out to friends, colleagues, immediate colleagues, people that were at the same organization as me or that I met through my small network. And I was just asking them things about, you know, what do you do? Um, what do you think about as you work? You know, give us an insight into your therapeutic world, your music therapy world. But I suppose as I continued to do this, I, I started to sense that, um, that there was more to be said and that the, the interview started to capture um, what music therapy was like in, in my small community. And uh, the reason why I named it Baselines is because it's a, it's a play on words. So obviously baseline is a is a musical term and it is the foundation of a song foundation of a piece of music um but of course baseline also has a scientific meaning it's where we begin uh it's the first score that we measure progress against and so 
the conversations that I had, I was sort of imagining that these would form the baseline of where our profession was, at least within my circles. And so as I continued these conversations and as time progressed without my podcast, um, we'd be able to look back and see what has changed. And because we knew that we'd be looking back in the conversations, we could look forward. And sometimes I'd ask my guests, where do you think music therapy needs to go? What do you think are the changes that might be coming? How do you think we need to evolve? What is the next steps? So, yeah, it was sort of a mixture of all of those different things. Sounds kind of a little bit similar to what you guys are doing too, which is awesome. So speaking on your self-care and how do you try to balance your life as a therapist, as an individual person outside of music, how do you still enjoy music for yourself, making time for education, all those different roles that you hold in your life? How do you avoid burnout? Yeah, okay. So to share a little bit personally, um, I. I probably am doing all of the wrong things to avoid burnout in some ways, but it's working for me. So I um, have fairly little separation between personal life and work life. And some of the things that contribute to that is that I am married to a music therapist who is fantastic. And I actually really love that. We have some really awesome conversations about music therapy, about music and about you know, human development and, and brains. And, and I love having those conversations, not just at work, but at home as well, because I love what I do. And the other part of my personal life that is very similar to my work life is that um, I live with my stepson, who is a beautiful nine-year-old boy uh, who loves Minecraft and Pokemon and Star Wars and Lego and Roblox and is also neurodivergent. He's autistic and dyslexic or what we now call specific learning disorder. And so my work being music therapy with primarily autistic people um, is very, very similar to my home life in that regard. And so sometimes um, it feels like I, I walk out the door of my workplace, I walk in the door of my home and I'm always happy to be home and I love the particular people in my home even more than I love my clients, but I'm doing very similar things. Um, but you know what, as much as that probably sounds like an absolute recipe for burnout um, and it is exhausting and it is a lot of work and I get to the end of the day and I just absolutely crash on the couch. I couldn't imagine life being any different and at least for the time being, this is exactly how I want it to be. So um, maybe it's just that I love what I do. The only other thing to say that you talked about in still enjoying music, um, I guess ironically, perhaps the more that I've followed neurologic music therapy, um, and the more I've implemented it into my work, the less I am, the less the music that I use looks like the kind of music that I might play by choice. And so that is kind of naturally separated out. I do a lot of um, use of hand drums as targets using a metronome, applying yeah, different ways of administering rhythm without any pitch or harmony or anything like that. When I do get to play guitar, that means it's, or piano, it's kind of just for myself. Um, I don't get to do that that often because of my busy life, but I guess the separation is pretty easy. For me at the moment, the way for me to enjoy music is right at the end of the day, um, as my stepson is falling asleep, I have this little game on my phone that I put on and I put my earbuds in and I listen to uh, a particular album of music at the moment it's blue by Joni Mitchell and I just try and soak in that music and enjoy it not as a therapist not as a musician even but just as music and and that works pretty well so it's a good album for it <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I only just discovered it like a week ago but um yeah good stuff now kind of reflecting your questions back to you <laughs> in terms of looking towards the future where yeah. do you think the profession is going in the future? Where do you want to see it grow? Where do you think it's already growing? It's such an interesting question. Um, and I was reflecting on how to answer this since you sent through the questions. 
look, I think that there's actually a real potential to shift in lots of different ways at the moment, not just to talk about music therapy, but to talk about the whole allied health sector, I think is, is important. So at least within the kind of work that I do, which let's say call it developmental neurodisability, um, pediatric often or otherwise, we have these competing behemoths um, of what's what we could just roughly call like behaviorism as informed by the DSM. And then this new, but not that new really, field of neuroscience. And as these two ways of looking at development and human, I don't even want to say human function because one of them is behavior and the other one is uh, is, is neuroanatomical. These two ways of looking at what humanity is, what, what a human is, these are potentially could go so far as to say these are at loggerheads and I think that they are not well reconciled to each other. Um, I don't know whether it's accurate to say that there's this struggle between these two and one will win over over the other. Who knows? Maybe they will both continue to act like passing ships in the night and you'll have people in opposite camps just doing what they do and that will continue indefinitely. But I think if music therapists were to get together as a collective and make a decision one way or the other, it'd be interesting to know which way they would go. Personally, I'm very much of the mind that we should be um, emphasizing uh, a neurological viewpoint of human function. I guess that is not surprising um, given my NMT bent. But um, to understand the human nervous system, to understand the sensory needs of our clients, to understand the neuroanatomical differences of the diagnoses and how they can actually be reliable and um, treated replicably, I think is such a game changer for any profession. And so if us as a music therapist can actually tap into that, find our own ways of becoming um of having interventions that are replicable through a standardized framework that uses a evidence-based lens. I don't just mean evidence-based. Evidence-based can mean so many different things, but evidence-based in a way that is um, addressing really consistent um, patterns of evidence, like through a neurological lens, then I think we can put ourselves into the best place possible to um, serve our clients and be recognized as equal members within the allied health community. Even then though, there is such a, um, an interesting question and a potentially fraught question of what exactly is the role of music therapy amongst these other function-based professions? So NMT leaders often talk about how NMT and music therapy generally uh, should be best thought of as stimulus specialists. We have this tool, music, um, and we are experts in this tool. And it is a powerful tool, but that's very different to, um, say, a speech pathologist who is an expert in the functioning and the diagnosis and, and the health aspect of speech or physiotherapists, or I think you call them physical therapists who are experts in motor function or psychologists who are expert in um, cognition and and the psychological elements that accompany that we we come not from a place of here's our box here's our particular little piece of human function that we're going to speak to we speak to wherever music speaks and so how we interact with our other allied health co-workers and colleagues um, is dynamic and potentially ever changing and I wonder whether that will ever get to the point where it's a little bit more solidified a little bit more codified where the conversations that you will have with your occupational therapist colleagues is yep I'll work on this and you work on that and that's the way we'll always do um, things incidentally I might just share that at the moment I have a the, the colleague that I'm working most closely with is an occupational therapist and um, she is very, very clever, and if you want to talk about vestibular function or retain primitive reflexes or auditory processing, you go and talk to her. But if you want to talk about proprioception, cognitive motor function, or rhythmicity, you go and talk to me. At the moment, that's a pretty arbitrary uh, d division of, of scope. 
Um, it's kind of just because they're the different things that each of us have uh, specialized and looked into. Um, so I wonder whether that will, will stay individual and, and um, individual to each different therapist and each different person or whether that will morph and change and there will be um, something a little bit more standardized. I'm, I'm throwing all sorts of opinions at you at the moment. But the other thing that I think um, the industry has the potential to grow in is that I think we do, at least within my circles, I think we need to have a really consistent framework. I think we do this work uh, with our clients and we affect change and we really, we've got such a powerful tool that we're not surprised by that anymore and we get fantastic results. But we don't always know <laughs> when we come into the therapy room what we're actually going to change, what is going to, what aspect of a property of music or other therapeutic mechanism is going to actually be the thing that is transformative. And so to have a framework um, of that underlies practice, whether that's a you know, music therapy, a music framework, or whether it's a psychological framework, whether it's something based on attachment, whether it's something based on something like the neurodiverse affirming movement, we need to have this theory that underpins what we do. And again, coming from my own point of view, I think one of the things that I love so much about NMT is that it gives a really comprehensive framework that underpins a whole variety of different work and practices and articulates the role of music and how it can help in a range of populations through a range of different interventions. And so, of course, I'm going to encourage anyone I can to adopt that framework. But even failing that, there has to be some kind of underpinning framework, underpinning approach, underpinning theory to be able to rest what we do on top of. And um, otherwise, I think we're at risk of becoming shallow and not taking it particularly seriously. Rant over. <laughs> That's always our favorite question to ask people because everyone always has such different answers for everything. Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of opinions floating around on these sort of things. I mean, our future is such a such an important thing to be grappling with. Hey, so we have to make sure we get it right. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well. That is the end of all of our questions. Do you have anything, Joe, that we didn't ask during the interview that you would like to throw in? That we already touched on it, but I was just going to encourage all of your listeners, if they're interested, to go and listen to my podcast as well, Baselines and Music Therapy. Um, but look, thank you for your time and for your generous ears, and it's just been such a pleasure talking with you guys. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes.